glad that you came, but you'll be glad that it's over. Um, I guess it's the same thing. Okay, um, I've been doing pictures of my heroes this whole time. Um, this is clearly, you know, my top hero. Now, this is, this is the poster from the summer school five years ago. Um, apparently, it was the last year that Era was the director and the first year that Eric was. Um, and this time, instead of just putting pictures of my heroes, I've given you a list of my heroes, the, the rest of them. And, and if you look at it, um, it's astounding how many names on this list have gone on to win the Nobel Prize. So I have to talk to Manny Yari and see if he thinks it's correlation or if there might be some causality. Um, so, okay. Uh, my, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I want to finish what I talked about last time on almost objective uncertainty. L let me just remind you, um, I wanted to see if I could get away with only living in a world with subjective uncertainty only and still getting the kinds of prospects that we get out there that we call objective uncertainty. And basically, the simple idea was that, you know, I want to look at events that are periodic along a straight line. So the example I gave is we're going to measure, we have a perfectly accurate analog thermometer. It can measure as many decimal points as you want. And, you know, whether you're betting on, you know, 45 degrees or higher, 45 degrees or lower, that's clearly subjective. In other words, not all of you will have a prior, and e even those who do won't have the same prior. If instead we're betting on whether the tenth decimal of the temperature is even or odd, then none of you care, and all of you don't care, which is the definition of a 50-50 coin. That's a periodic event. So what I just want to do now is just be more formal and show you how those periodic events uh, do the entire job. So this is what I want to do, and this is how I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to create almost objective events, and the importantest thing I have to say is these are purely subjective. I'm only going to use the thermometer, which is a purely subjective variable. I'm going to take those events to create acts out of them, the purely subjective acts, and I'm going to do something that, that's often done in economic modeling, for example, Anscombe and Allman did it. Instead of taking objective mixtures of subjective acts, I just realized if I cover things, you're still, it's still being projected on my hand. Um, instead of taking objective mixtures of sub -act, subjective acts, which is often done in modeling um, things, I want to see if I can do almost objective mixtures. So technically, these are subjective mixtures um, on subjective acts. And what I want to show you is that if you do it this way, you get all of, ex in, in the limit, as you measure the 20th decimal, 30th decimal, you're going to get all the properties of objective events. So let me just remind you what those properties are. This is my goal. If it's really objective, your revealed likelihood, which way you bet, won't depend on the prizes. Maybe you're indifferent with a coin, but if a, a die is purely objective, you're going to bet on it being bigger than 2, then less than or equal to 2. I don't care what the prizes are. Another thing that's true about coins is that the outcome of the coin has got nothing to do with the temperature. If it did, I'm not sure I would want to call it a, an objective event. So this is a property I'm going to say is necessary for something to be truly objective. The next thing I want to say has to do with preferences. Last time I talked about probabilistic sophistication and that meant <coughs> that when you look at subjective events, you have a well-defined Bayesian prior and you use those numbers to form your preferences. Um, if I give you objective lotteries, of course you use those numbers. They're objective numbers. So everybody is probabilistically sophisticated over objective events. When we give you the LA paradox, you may not have expected utility preferences, but it, when it says there's a 0.89 chance of a million dollars, you don't say, well, that makes my prior something else. So you use the probabilities. 
If it's objective, you use those probabilities. Another property is this. I'm going to skip it because it's explaining is not worth the opportunity of my time. Um, and these things are going to be true of everybody. Now, if you're probabilistically sophisticated, if you do look at purely subjective uncertainty and form priors, which you may not, but if you say I have a prior over that thermometer, then if I ask you to bet on a temperature range and a fair coin, then you're basically, <coughs> you're not going to let the, the, whether it's heads or tails, af affect how you bet. That's a poor way of saying it, I'm sorry. Um, the other property is if you're expected utility, which you may not be, but if you are, then your, your preferences are linear in objective lotteries. That's called the independence axiom. So I'm going to say these are the things, I, I don't want to say this is a necessary and sufficient condition for a bet to be objective, but if it's going to be objective, it's going to satisfy these things. Mm -hmm. Um, in five, uh, I think, I, I think I just mean mutual independence or your revealed likelihood of the coin doesn't depend on the temperature and your betting behavior on the temperature, whatever it is, isn't going to depend on what the coin is. Yeah, that's, um. It, in, I'm sorry, independence suggests a probabilistic property. Um, what I, it, it, it's trying to suggest betting preferences. So if you really think of the coin 50-50, you wouldn't care which way I bet if it was joint with the coin on the temperature. If you thought it was two-thirds, one-third, then you'd bet the two-thirds independently of the temperature also. Bet. Okay, so I think I mentioned this last time. I'm just going to use the classic subjective setting here are your outcomes. What I need is that the state space be a real interval. It has to be a thermometer. Okay. Um, these are events. This is what we've been calling an act, X1 dollars if event E1 occurs. Again, the deal is these events have to be mutually exclusive and exhaustive. It's real important. I'm going to say it every third sentence. This is all purely subjective. It's all based on this which is a subjective variable, the temperature. This is what you bet on, subjective acts, um, and these are your preferences. This is your preference relation, and this is your ordinal preference function over these things that represent it. Okay, um, it's time to say it again. Okay, and let me show you um, examples of this. Let me take someone who has separability across the events and is probabilistically sophisticated. They use probabilities, the mu's. Each event enters only through its prior. And once you enter them, you're separable in those terms. Can you be separable and not probabilistically sophisticated? Can you have these plus signs without mu's? Yeah, it turns out if you're state dependent, you can be. Okay, that integral is the plus sign. Uh, excuse me, you get, you get the plus signs here. Um, if you're not separable, but you're still probabilistically sophisticated, this is what I talked about the other day. This is Professor L.A. He uses, he has a prior, but he doesn't have an expected utility way of representing it. And gee, if you're not separable or not probabilistically sophisticated, then you just have a general W. I'm just gonna assume it's smooth. Okay. And my job is to study what's going on here. Okay. So let me begin by giving you the first example. I'm going to call this almost ethically neutral. It was Ramsey or somebody, who, I can't remember, who called the uh, event ethically neutral if it didn't matter which way you wanted to bet. Okay. You can't have an event that's ethically neutral for everybody. If it's a subjective event, people have different priors. Okay. But let me give you an event that is practically ethically neutral for everybody. And it's basically what I said. Here's the thermometer. Split it up 
into m groups, m equal intervals, and my event is going to be the left half of each interval. Okay. Then here's what's going to be true. This is the theorem of Poincaré. As I let m grow and keep splitting the last half, then any probability measure that has a density is going to say I assign probability one half to this in the limit. We're, as m grows, we're basically betting on the 10th decimal, the 11th decimal, things like that. And the way to see it is this. There's your density. These, these black lines there are your events. And as it gets finer and finer, half the area is gray. That's all it's saying. Okay. And like I said, Poincaré showed that theorem. Okay. In the limit, if you have priors, even if they're different from the next person's, in the limit, you won't care which way you bet. Okay. So this is that event, that periodic event as M grows. This is the complement. In the limit, anybody will be indifferent between that. So in the limit, people are ethically neutral. Um, and it turns out you can prove this if your subjective expected utility this would be your expected utility if they really were objective. And it turns out your expected utility over these almost objective events converges to that. If your state dependent expected utility, then your attitudes, your valuation of these bets on whether the temperature is even or odd as M grows, that converges to exactly what you would do if you were state dependent expected utility and we're bidding on a 50-50 coin. If you're probabilistically sophisticated, remember that means you convert every event to some lottery value and measure it that way. It turns out that value will be the limit of your preference function, again, as m grows, as we get, go to the 10th decimal, 11th decimal, 12th decimal. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you're expected utility, you're state dependent, or probabilistically sophisticated. It's going to be true for that W, any W. And this is what's important to me. I need W to be smooth to get that result. Okay, let me go through those properties and show you these almost objective events satisfy them. The first one, er, I'm sorry, that this ethically neutral event does. Which way you bet on whether the tenth decimal is odd or even shouldn't depend on whether you're betting within some interval or some other interval or anything like that and give me an event E on the thermometer. Give me one of these even odd events. And it turns out I can bet, this says the tenth decimal is even in this interval range in the temperature occurs. This says that interval, in, interval range occurs and the bet, the tenth decimal is odd. Okay, you won't care which way you bet. This, this almost ethically neutral event is independent. Your betting preferences don't depend on the interval we're doing. Um, and that's going on here. Ease that interval. So we're betting on whether the temperature lands within the interval and the tenth decimal is even. That's the same as betting on whether it lands in that interval and the tenth decimal is odd. It's independent of what that interval is. That's what I meant by this two-way independence of objective and subjective valuations. Um, can they be defined? Yeah, this is just this definition of that. And as I told you last time, you know, anything you think of, whether it's a coin or a roulette wheel, really generates its uncertainty in these periodic events. Instead of the thermometer, the coin is the force of the flip. It's just going to be periodic in that. For the roulette wheel, each number is in the force of the spin. It'll be periodic. So in some sense, what we call objective uncertainty has this structure anyway. So let me do this in general. Let's take an event now, divide the interval into m events, and look at the left or the middle or the right third. Okay. If we do that, excuse me, these will each of these will approximate an objective, objective event with probability one-third. What if I look at the left 40% of each interval? 
people will treat that in the limit as if it was a, a 0.4 probability event. Here's how you generate them in general. Take the unit interval. If you want, take the left half as I did, or the right half, or the left one third, or something like that. Take any subset of it. And what I want you to do is split the thermometer into m equal intervals and take this subset of each of those intervals. So it doesn't have to be just the left half or the right half. It can basically be anything. Um, so now I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to use this notation for this idea. This is your subset script P if you create a periodic event by putting sips, script P into these, each of these m intervals. I'm just going to call it that. You're dividing the state space into m intervals, and you're projecting p into those m intervals. Okay, I'm I'm going to skip ahead because I I've basically given you the intuition, and there's something more I want to talk about today. Um, but here's a question: How come we don't see almost objective securities? I could bet I could create this for you. Okay. It'd be easy enough to create. How come they're not traded? For the same reason, coin, objective coin flips aren't traded on Dow Jones. This has got nothing to, in the limit. This is completely independent of the firm's behavior. That's why we don't see them. You would predict we don't see them. Portfolios we wouldn't see. People like to match a share of Coca-Cola and a share of Nestle. But what we call uh, diversification is we're averaging the payoffs. What we call it's a, a almost objective portfolio is we're being periodic. You get a whole share of Coca-Cola if the 10th decimal is even. That's a 50-50 coin flip between these two shares. There's no reason it should be traded. Um, they can't resolve differences of opinion because if they're almost objective, everybody has the same prior, which is what um, securities are supposed to do. They don't let you hedge against subjective events because they're independent of subjective events. Everything I say, if someone walked in now and didn't hear me say the word almost, they'd think I was giving you a lecture about ob objective events, all the properties. Um, they don't let you s diversify, and you don't see these, like I said, for the same reason you don't see these people flipping coins. Okay, let me just go through the properties and I'll, I'll, I'll quit. What properties of almost objective events are going to be revealed by the special case of expected utility people? So here's the formula for expected utility. Here's the formula for state dependent, but let me ignore that. Here's an expected utility maximizer. Mu is their prior over the thermometer. Okay, it's, not, it's purely subjective. I, okay, I've done 30 sentences, so I have to say purely subjective 10 times, okay? Um, here's what it is. The key aspect of expected utility is that it's linear in the probabilities. Which probabilities? Objective probabilities. That's the independence axiom. This formula will be linear in the almost objective probabilities. Um, what's true for a slightly broader class of people? People who aren't expected utility, they're Bayesian, they have priors and use them but they're not expected utility. If I give you a, a bet based on these almost objective events, you will put them into your prior as well. I'm sorry, you will evaluate them the same way by V, which, is, which looks at the X's and the P's. All these things come in the same way objective probabilities come in. Okay. Here's the, here's the things I put on the first slide that I have to convince you of, or at least announce to you. If I have two sets, script P and script P prime, and for each of them I create the periodic event based on them, then whichever one has the greater uniform Lebesgue measure will be the one you want to bet on. Okay. If the Lebesgue measure of P is bigger than lambda's Lebesgue measure. If it's bigger than that of P prime, I'd rather, and X is the best prize, I'd rather bet X on the periodic event based on P. 
the other property of objective uncertainty that I mentioned is this independence property. This basically says, here's P and P prime. If I want to attach them this way to the event E, then this is where I get X star if the tenth test decimal is even and the temperature is in the range E. This bet is where the good outcome is on, is whether the, that tenth decimal is odd. You don't care whether that tenth decimal is even or odd. Yep, you only win if the temperature is in this range also. But um, you don't, uh, pardon me, you're basing your bet on which one has a bigger lambda. If they're equal, you don't care. Okay, um, this says a probabilistically sophisticated person will treat these events on the basis of their lambdas. Remember for that 50-50 event, lambda is one half. For the one-third event, lambda is one-third. Um, and this is something else that's true. So I think what I want to do is skip over all, all this because of the opportunity cost of my time. Let me do this last thing. Can I figure out your bets on an objective lottery based on your bets over temperature bets? Can I infer objective risk preferences from preferences over those first, those purely subjective events? They're purely subjective and they're purely subjective. Okay, now I'm nine sentences ahead of myself. Yeah, here's the thermometer and here's a uniform random variable. Here you're betting on whether the tenth decimal is even or odd. It's joint. It's, it, it's the th temperature and the value of this uniform random variable. So the bet is the gray area. Let me change the bet. Let me take each one of these squares and turn it. Now I want you to bet on this gray area. As M gets really big, the changes get really small. And it's the first, the first order effect will be zero. So in the limit, you won't care. And let me twist them one more time. You can show that in the limit, you don't care between betting on the tenth decimal or betting based on whether this perfectly uniform random variable, it's tenth decimal. So here I'm deriving your objective preferences, and you can get all your objective preferences from purely subjective bets. Okay, this is simply a list of those properties I need for an objective uh, event or objective lotteries, and these are the theorems that say yes, as M goes to infinity, they satisfy all of them. So the, the conclusion of this is I don't need to live in a world where there's two kinds of uncertainty. There are two kinds of events, temperature intervals and periodic events. But, you know, coins are periodic events, roulette wheels are periodic events. How about I keep the form of uncertainty the same and look at the difference in the events? Because that'll let me get all of the features of what we call objective uncertainty. Okay, now I want to do something uh, more interesting and Maya quoted Kahneman as saying, prospect theory is a theory of two outcome lotteries under objective uncertainty. Okay, well let me think about instead of two outcomes, three outcome lotteries. And instead of objective uncertainty, let me think about subjective uncertainty. So it's the complete opposite. It'd be nice to know the refutable implications of prospect theory in that range, but it's only defined over that smaller range. In other words, what I want to look at is attitudes towards ambiguity in a world where there's three possible outcomes. And here's what I mean. Think of all those Ellsberg experiments, all those things. Um, oh, I'm sorry, let me give you two bets. There's an urn, one ball, it's either black or white, and there's a fair coin. Here's one bet, here's another one. Okay, I want you to say how you'd rank them. Now, it's cheating for me to tell you about the bets, but let me do, okay? Plus minus 8,000 is the range of uncertainty. This bet here says your range of uncertainty depends on that fair coin. This bet here says the uncertainty is distributed around the subjective 
football. Are you allowed to be indifferent? Of course, they're your preferences. But one argument would say, you know, if I'm ambiguity averse, I'd rather stake these things on the 50-50 going than on the informationally symmetric, but nonetheless subjective ball. So probably I'd do that. Okay, let me slightly change it and take that fair coin and slightly bend it. How much? Not much. Now it's subjective. Now you don't know the probability. But it does have a probability in the following sense. If you flipped it a million times, or at least a zillion, you'd get a limiting proportion of heads. You just don't know what that is. But you know what? That's the same as an Ellsberg urn. If you drew from a, a stochastic Ellsberg urn with replacement, you'd get the same thing. Nonetheless, these are now both subjective events. This is much less subjective because the coin is only slightly bent. So whatever that unknown probability is, it's close to a half. Let me try to argue that you'd still have the same preferences. This is subjective. This is subjective. Both are ambiguous. This is more ambiguous. And I'd rather stake my uncertainty on heads, tails, the less ambiguous partition than that. So I'm going to argue you'd still prefer F1 or F2, even though I've gotten rid of objective uncertainty now. I'm never going to use it again okay, for the entire rest of the summer school. Okay. Um, so, well, not quite. <laughs> Excuse me. Let me give you a different <coughs> problem. Take a 50-50 coin and let C dollars be your uncertainty equivalent of this $100 zero coin flip. Now I'm going to offer you two different bets. You can either get zero dollars or hundred dollars or C dollars. See, it's not 50, but it's halfway between in preference. Okay. Here's an urn that has exactly one red ball. You know, e there's two other balls. Each of those other two balls can be black or white. It's an Ellsberg urn. This is a different Ellsberg urn. It's pretty damn close. What's the only difference? Here, the ambiguity is across the two worst outcomes, the middle and the worst outcome. Here, that ambiguity is across the middle and the best outcome. So this has ambiguity in, in the left tail. That has ambiguity in the right tail. And again, I'm making it symmetric in preference. OK, maybe you don't care, but one argument is I'd rather have this one. I'm not sure I want to bear the ambiguity down here. You could be indifferent. You could have the other preference. But these are the two kinds of examples I want to look at. Call that the upper lower tail example. OK, what is it about Ellsberg's paradox? Well. Again, the, the point of this talk is to try to convince you that all these paradoxes, the classic ones, only involve two possible outcomes. There was no C or anything like, or $50 or, or anything. And the models of ambiguity economists have developed were based on these and fit these pretty well. But the problem is once you allow three outcomes, new aspects of ambiguity aversion can reveal themselves. And I want to look at how the classic models can handle these new aspects. OK, what is it that makes the Els Oh, and here's Ellsberg's four color paradox. Have, it, have you all heard of the Ellsberg paradox at this point in the summer school? OK. Um, and these are the preferences people have. OK, here's another one of Ellsberg's paradoxes. All of these only involve two outcomes. OK, these are the preferences. OK, here's what we've learned from Ellsberg. Leonard Savage would not care. He would say it's the substitution uh, principles. Th this pair looks the same as that pair, same square. All I did was change this and this. Ellsberg says, yeah, it matters. Let's take the four states of nature. This urn has two unknown balls. They could both be black. Ball number one could be black, the other one yellow, or things like that. Let's convert these bets into maps from the states of nature into payoffs. Uh, pardon me, into probabilities. OK, this bet, betting on red, said, I don't care the composition of the urn. You're going to get a one-third chance of winning if you're just staking it on red. What are your chances of winning 
the, your state dependent chances of winning for bet F2. Well, let's see. If both balls are black, both of these are black, it's a two-thirds chance of winning, a one-third chance of losing. If one is black and one is white, then F2 gives you a one-third chance. If both, pardon, black and yellow, if both are yellow, in other words, there's no black balls, your probability of winning is zero. So no surprise, your probability of winning depends on the state of nature. That's an Anska moment act. Let me do those same things for the other two bets. I'm just looking, taking a bet for each state of nature, for each composition of this unknown part, figuring out what you would win. You know, if for this bet, um, well, for this bet, if they were both yellow, then this bet would give you 100% 100 chance of winning. I'm just doing the same thing. Okay, let's look at how Leonard Savage, oh, I'm sorry, and let's do the same thing for this bet. Same idea. Okay, here's what Savage showed us. Take the average of these numbers. It's one-third. For bet F2, take the average of these numbers. It's one-third. One-third, one-third. The average of these numbers is one-half. This average is one-half, one-half, one-half. Savage would say my overall expected utility is the same for these. I'm sorry, these are one-third, these are two-thirds. Savage would say my overall expected utility for F1 or F2 is the same. Why should I care? What Ellsberg showed us is that it's not just the average, it's how this probability is distributed across states. F2 averages a one-third also, but I would rather have my probability of winning not depend on the state, not depend on the composition of the urn, than have that probability of winning depend on it, even though it's the same average. This is what Ellsberg showed us. It's not just the mean of expected utility, it's the distribution state by state. Okay, now to handle these things, we've developed, we've developed lots of models of ambiguous preferences, but let me go over the top ones. This is the reference point. This is, this is Savage's for each, each event in this subjective bet. You, have, you put it in your prior, you multiply it by your utility function and add it up. Well, one of the alternatives, the, the rank dependent of the Choquet model, due, due, due to Schmeidler and Choquet, basically says, I want to treat these events, I don't quite want to assign each one of them a prior. I want to assign each one of those events something a little complicated. -er. And this is a transformation that makes sure that the weights you give on every event, they're not well defined like this, or they're not well defined at, they're not unique like this, but they do add up to one, this telescopic property. So if, if you've looked at that stuff, that's certainly the most predominant model. Um, another model that's a little bit easier to fathom and has been studied by um, Gilboa and Schmeidler is the min-max model. It says, I've got a bunch of priors on the state space. And every time you give me a subjective bet, I look at what its expected utility would be on each prior, and I, I, I say, whatever's the worst is going to happen. So I look at the prior that gives me the worst expected utility, and that's how I value the bet. Um, very pessimistic. Another one um, due to Klibanoff, Maranacci, and Mukherjee says, no, here's what's happening. These are all the different priors. I have a prior over the priors. And here's what I do. I calculate the expected utility of this gamble for each prior. And I say, what's the overall expected utility? I don't pick the worst, but I use my prior over these pri priors, generates a prior over these expected utility levels. And there's that concave feet. I'm risk averse in that. This is called smooth because these models will have kinks in a certain way. And finally, another model developed by a bunch of Italians, and I can never get their, <laughs> their names straight. There's, there's five Italians who have almost identical <laughs> names. No, I'll tell you after. 
Um, but this model basically is this model, and they add a, a term that depends on each prior. So rather than looking at the structure, let me just announce these four. <coughs> well, like I said, if you put the LA bets into these formulas, and you, know, you make phi concave and you do the right thing, uh, I'm sorry, the Ellsberg bets into these formulas, you'll get the Ellsberg preferences. But I want to look at some e events that don't just involve 0 or 100. I want to look at three outcome events and see how well these do. So let me give you some examples. Um, this is what I've just said. And this is my, my, what I'd like to show you. Okay, I want to show you there's three kinds of effects that give problems for some of these models. One is that once you have three outcomes, there's outcome values that aren't necessarily adjacent to each other. If you only have 0 and 100, each outcome is next to the other one. If you have minus 8,000, 0, or plus 8,000, I've got two outcomes that, that aren't adjacent to each other. Turns out that gives problems for some of these models. Another type of model problem I'm going to show you is you're going to take my favorite world, which is one of purely subjective uncertainty, and show you that LA is going to give these models trouble. And finally, I'm going to show you what I think is the most important, is can people's attitudes towards ambiguity depend on the outcome levels? We know that their attitudes towards risk can. Things like, you know, diminishing absolute, decreasing absolute risk aversion or increasing relative risk aversion. Attitudes towards risk to depend on whether you're betting around a million dollars or you're betting around two hundred dollars. Can attitudes towards ambiguity depend? It'd be nice to think they could. Okay, let me do this one. And here's your slightly bent coin example that you saw before. Three outcomes. And what's driving it is, are these two that are not adjacent. Okay. For those of you familiar with the rank-dependent model, this argument will be clear. Uh, I apologize for people who aren't, but the argument will only take 90 seconds. How does the rank-dependent or the show-k model value these bets? Well, again, let me take 90 seconds for, for the subset of the audience. The better than set, uh, the, the at least as good at set, which is the set that gives you the best outcome, isn't the same for the two bets. But by symmetry, you've got to value it the same. Then the show K model says, OK, now look at the at least as good as set for the next highest outcome, which is 0. That set, um, oh, I'm sorry. Set, uh, OK, this says the set, the states that give you at least 8,000 are symmetric. The set of states that give you at least 0 are this, is the same set. That's enough of a condition to say that the rank-dependent model must be indifferent between these two. It's good that it has predictions, but it predicts too much. I tried to convince you before that it's natural enough to want to stake the uncertainty on this slightly bent coin than to stake it on this very ambiguous goal. So the, the point of this example is that the Choke model cannot model different attitudes towards different amounts of uncertainty, which is, which is bad news. It'd be nice to think that a model could. OK, this I'll take very quickly. How can I take purely subjective uncertainty and get LA paradoxes? Well, you should know by now, because I can take purely subjective uncertainty and get events that look a lot like those purely objective events that LA gave us. So really, there's not that much to say. Let's take expected utility and these four models. What I want to do again is look at these models of choice. Um, let's see how to say it. I'm going to show you that subjective expected utility will be inconsistent with LA preferences, um, that the multiple priors model will be inconsistent. In other words, it predicts the same thing in LA that expected utility would predict. So someone who has LA preferences will violate this 
just as much as they'll violate expected utility. This model will be inconsistent with the LA paradox, and so will this one. Rank dependent model is consistent, but it had problems on the previous effect, the different sources of ambiguity. And here's how you do it. I did this before. Okay, you saw yesterday. Can you really get a purely subjective bet on a fair coin? Can you really get an objective bet on a thermometer? Here you flip it and see if the number of flips is bigger than 17 or not. That's subjective. Here you measure the temperature and see if the tenth decimal is often odd or eed. Odd or eed. Um, oven, oven. Even or odd. Pardon me. Okay. Here's your subjective bet on the fair coin. Here again is your almost objective event. This is your 50-50 bet on a purely subjective thermometer. All I'm going to do is use these events to create the LA paradox bets. These models will evaluate LA paradox bets. The bad news is these models are all going to have expected utility preferences over tenth decimal point bets. And once I get that, the results follow immediately. Let me show you how I, how I can, uh-huh. When you, when you say that you can create an LA paradox using purely subjective events, it does require that you be able to take those events and, and subdivide them. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that they be almost objective. So, 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 so you are you're re requiring Smoothness. Smoothness. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I should have said that at the beginning. Yeah, all, what I need for all of this is smoothness and that the state space be an inter, a real interval. Okay, let me show you how to create the Ellsberg paradox, uh, pardon me, the LA paradox on an urn. Uh, I'm sorry, let me jump ahead. Let me show you how to create the Ellsberg paradox on a thermometer. And you could say that's impossible. The Ellsberg paradox does, doesn't just involve subjective uncertainty. Remember there's one, exactly one red ball out of three? The Ellsberg paradox um, is what it is because it involves both subjective and objective uncertainty. And it's that incomplete attitudes or inconsistent attitudes that makes it a paradox. Let me give you the Ellsberg paradox on a thermometer. Let me give you the Ellsberg paradox without any objective uncertainty. And here's how I do it. One of the events is that you get a red ball. One third probability. Split that thermometer up and take the left one third of each interval. In the limit, as I showed you, everybody's going to value this bet the way, uh, bets on this the way they would value bets on that. How am I going to event, represent the event black on a thermometer? Black has both objective and subjective uncertainty. It's living in a subjective part of the urn that I have objective information about, namely that this is as objective. The whole subjective part has exactly objective uncertainty one-third. How can I do that? Take the thermometer and do this. Okay, here's how I want to do it. Let's see. There are four states of nature. Remember, both balls are black. BB, black, white, white, black, white, white. What I want to do is, if both balls are black, give me the left two-thirds of each interval. If if it's black, white, or white, black, give me the, the first one third. And if they're both white, give me that. This is an event that's purely subjective, and it has the same mapping from the composition of the urn to probabilities that I showed many slides ago. it has this structure. If you bet on black, 
and F2 is a bet on black, then for one-fourth of the states, you get two-thirds probability. For the middle half, you get one-third probability. And for the final quarter, you get nothing. That's what I did on the thermometer. For one quarter of the states, you have a two-thirds chance. For the middle two states, you have a one-third chance. And when the final state, yellow, yellow, you don't have anything of a chance. If you were to instead bet on yellow, if you won zero, zero, a hundred dollars, then the thermometer event would look like that. No surprise, it's just the reflection of the black event. These are what the three events look like on the thermometer. Let me look at the Ellsberg um, bets. Pardon me, these are how the events look on the thermometer. And by the way, these sets better be mutually exclusive and they better be exhaustive. Okay, well none of them overlap. This is the left one-third. This is the middle and the right two-thirds. Things like that. And if you take the union, the colors look wacky, but the union is exactly the interval range. Okay, so here are those four Ellsberg bets. Remember bet one? You bet on red, it had a one-third chance. That's b basically partitioning the thermometer to a zillion intervals, and you win if, if, the, if the temperature ends up being in the left third of the interval. Bet two was you won if and only if the ball drawn was black. Here is the temperature set, the subset of the interval that corresponds to black. Bet F3 I don't know if you can remember, was that you won either if it was red or it was yellow. So you would win on the union of the black, uh, the red event and the yellow event. And bet F4 was you would win on black or yellow. Okay, let me look at these events and see that I've got the Ellsberg effect. The total area here is the same as the total area there. If you had a uniform prior, you wouldn't care. Okay. But people prefer this to that. Okay. Now, the cool thing about the Ellsberg paradox is if you had the same thing to yellow, you get a reversing of the choice. I don't want to call it a preference reversal because I've changed the objects. So you're reversing. Let me do that. Let me take these two bets and before on yellow you didn't get anything, to create F3 and F4, I now gave you $100 on yellow. So F1 is just red, F2 is just black, F3 is red with yellow, and F4 is black with yellow. Now how do you want to bet? This bet has ambiguity. The probability of winning depends on the temperature range. This bet doesn't. Yes, there's different colors, but the set here is the left two-thirds of each interval. So this is doing what the Ellsberg paradox was doing. It was taking a pair of bets, one purely objective, one involving ambiguity, looking at your ranking, then it took a state that had the same payoff, namely nothing, yellow, and changed the payoff on yellow from nothing to something, to that hundred dollars. So here's how I can represent the Ellsberg effects on that purely subjective thermometer. Okay. Well, here's a little cleaner way of seeing these sets. So here's, here you can see it's one-third. Here you can see the probability of winning depends on the composition of the balls, etc. Okay, um, I can take the common ratio effect. I think they named the name to common ratio effect was given by uh, McCrimmon and Larson earlier when they, when they did the, the same kinds of experiments. I can do the same thing here. Let me, let me take these particular bets and convert them to a thermometer. This says you win $6,000 on the left 45% of each interval. This bet says 
you're going to win 3,000 on 90% of each interval. So here, 90% of each interval is the event you win. This says you win 6,000 on the left 1%. And this says you win uh, 3,000 on the left 50th worse. So here are, here's how you can represent the common ratio effect this way. Here's, um, oh, and we know that expected utility, if your expected utility with utility function u, I don't care what your prior is. For any prior, any, any smooth prior in the limit, that prior is going to attach two-thirds probability. That's, that's what I said at the beginning. So I don't care the prior. Every savage person will have this expected utility of this bet. Every savage person will have this expected utility of this bet. And this expected utility of that, and this expected utility of that. Now I know how your ranking is. If you like this over this, you have to like that over that. Look at the formulas. So here is the common ratio effect on the thermometer. It doesn't really involve objective uncertainty. Okay. And the argument I'm based on is basing it on is you're treating this left 45% the way you would treat a 45% objective lottery. That's what you get under smoothness. Okay. This is the same thing for the multiple priors model, just like the subjective expected utility. In the limit, it would value things that way and hence be violated by the standard preferences. Um, and there's a, I guess I didn't do the other models. Oh, the smooth model has the same problems. So, you know, these are three outcome bets. You could win zero, you could win 3,000, you could win 6,000. Once you have three outcome bets, these models of purely subjective uncertainty inherit all of the heretofore objective LA problems. Common LA paradox, common consequence effect, common ratio effect. Okay, let me end by doing what I think is the most interesting, which is can I have decreasing absolute ambiguity aversion or whatever you want to call it? Can my attitudes towards ambiguity depend on whether the ambiguity is around a million dollars or whether it's around two hundred dollars. And again, I don't care, this, this doesn't depend on reference effects. I don't care if million dollars means ending up with a million dollars or if million dollars means acquiring an additional one. It, it won't matter for the argument. Okay, well, I gave you this example. Okay. Um, C is your certainty equivalent between a 50-50 gamble. That comes from your objective preferences. I just want it to be halfway in between preference. Okay. Would you rather have the ambiguity distributed across the two worst outcomes, the middle and the worst, or would you rather have the ambiguity whether you get C or 100 bucks? I can't tell you because it's your preferences and you have a right to be indifferent um, I can't say, I, I would prefer, I'd, I'd be more scared of this one. I would prefer the right one. So I'm not trying to argue how to choose. What I want to convince you of is any model of ambiguity aversion ought to be flexible enough to let me choose. Okay, it, it, you can be indifferent, but you get, you ought to be able to exhibit declining ambiguity aversion in wealth or increasing ambiguity in wealth. Okay, and again, they have the same ambiguity structure, it's just I've moved it here. Okay, um, and this is the observation I made, and like I said, they're equally spaced in utils. Leonard Savage wouldn't care, he would be indifferent. He wouldn't care in the sense that he'd have to not care, his model says you must be indifferent. You'd, you'd assign subjective probabilities of one-third, one-third, one-third in each case. The subjective expected utility model says both have the same expected utility. It predicts no preference. It would be violated if you had a preference. Um, but 
you know, this argument I made is if the distribution of utility matters and if ambiguity aversion somehow reflects I'm scared of ambiguity, you could argue is that the ambiguity of getting zero is scarier than the ambiguity of, you know, whether or not I get $100. Okay, well, let's look, let's take this, this example and see what the models predict. The rank dependent model, the multiple priors model, the smooth model, and the variational preferences model. Let me calculate their valuation of this gamble and their respective valuations of this gamble. Just put the data into the formula. Hell, the rank dependent model has the same formula for this gamble as it does for that gamble. Hell, I'm being recorded, so I'm only saying hell. Okay. If I were the author of one of these models, I'd turn off the mic to react and then turn it back on. Um, the multiple priors model gives the same formula. So does this model and so does that model. Each four of these models has a prediction that's good, but it has two strong predictions. It says you can't care. It doesn't allow you to have ambiguity preferences that depend on the wealth. Models of risk aversion do, but these four models of ambiguity don't. And it tr what is it about this gamble that has this property? Well, let's look at those four states of nature. Either both balls are black, one's black, one's white, they're both white. And let's do what I did before and look at the what the expected utility looks like. These bets are different. But so depending on the composition of the urn, this bet here, this is, this is the objective lottery you would get if both balls here were black. What would it be? It'd be a one-third chance of getting 100, otherwise nothing. This is the expected utility you would get from this urn if both were white. If both were white, there'd be a two-thirds chance. Both, if the, both these walls are white, there'd be a two-thirds chance of getting C dollars and that one-third. Let me just do it. This is the statewide distribution of the lotteries. Let me calculate the respective expected utilities of these. And remember, C, that certainty equivalent, was specifically chosen to have a utility of one half. Okay, that's why, that's why C is there. Okay, let me take the right lottery. And for each composition of the unknown part, look at the lottery it induces. Let's say both balls are black there. Okay. Then you'd have a two-thirds chance of C they're both black, and a one-third chance of zero. Two-thirds, one-third. That's different from this. The lotteries they imply under both being black are different lotteries. These are going to be different lotteries, too. Okay. How come these four models say you have to be indifferent between left and right? The state-wise lotteries are different. But if I calculate the expected utilities, the distribution of expected utilities across the states are identical. And it turns out these four models, that, that's all that matters for these models. It's how the expected utility level varies with the state of nature. This is the sense in which these four models are too restrictive. They're subject to this kind of example. Um, let me now look at different examples. I, what I did in the previous example is I moved the ambiguity to higher wealths. Let me look at some other ways I could look at how ambiguity varies. Once I've got more than two outcomes, I can do a lot of stuff. It's, it's kind of like objective uncertainty. Until you have three outcomes, the phenomenon of increasing risk or risk aversion can't exist. What I'm trying to show you in this paper is once you've got three outcomes, there's aspects of ambiguity aversion 
that couldn't exist before. The problem was these models were trying to fit the Ellsberg, the two outcome Ellsberg bets, and they do. It's just once I look at three outcome bets, I got problems. There's other things I could do. Um, what would it mean to spread the ambiguity, to take a bet and not just move its ambiguity up or down to spread it? Well, one thing I could do is this. Here are two different urns. Here's the ambiguity here lives in, th I'm sorry, here are two identical urns. Um, the ambiguity is on three, four, separately on five, six. What would it mean to spread the ambiguity? How about I do this? Oops. That three, four, I take it, keep the ambiguity structure the same, but change the outcomes down. Now I've mute, moved the ambiguity from three to four down to lower, spread it down. The other thing I could do, let me now take these two payoffs and move them both up. Now I've taken this urn and instead of re locating the braces, I just replaced the values. This is one of the things it could mean to spread ambiguity. I'd have to look at what those models predict. Here's another thing it could mean. These two urns are the same. Here the ambiguity is located three across two and separately four to five. Another way we could talk about spreading the ambiguity is to take these braces and move them down. This is kind of what I did in the, in the bent coin example. I think these are two different things, and I have yet to explore you know, what the models predict, but this is another thing. Um, I talked about ambiguity version at low outcomes, at high outcomes. Here's another way I could do it. I could introduce ambiguity at low versus high. These two words are identical again. They're not ambiguous. Look at the ambiguity structure. They're 50-50 urns. Okay. I could introduce ambiguity here, or I could instead introduce it here. There, I've just introduced it. I've moved 3-3 three, three down and up to 2-4 in a symmetric way. Um, I could instead introduce the ambiguity here, move 5-5 five, five, down to 4 and up to 6. This would be another way to ask the question, would you re are you more averse to ambiguity down here than you would be to the introduction of ambiguity up there? It's another way to represent decreasing constant ab absolute ambiguity version or things like that. And, oh, th I'm sorry, I did check these. The models do rank them as indifferent, okay? They don't care whether you spread the ambiguity from 3-3 three, three up here. Create, created ambiguity where it wasn't before. If it was 3-3, three, three, there's no ambiguity. I create it down at the bottom. Instead, I create it up at the top. The models can't let you have a preference. And again, the reason is if you take this bet, again, there's Let's see, how many states of nature? Four, okay. Th this first ball could either be black or white. The second ball could either be red or green. So what does this bet imply in the state of nature that this one's black and this one's red? One half chance of two, one half chance of five. Expected utility of three and a half. If, this, if the first ball is black and the other one's green, then it's a 50-50 gamble between two and five, and there's the expected utility. And for each composition, each of the four states of nature here, there's the lottery you get, and there's the expected utility of it. Take that right-hand bet, which is different. Depending on the state, it gives you a different lottery. Now, if both ball, if, if I, the first ball is black and the second one's red, it's a 50-50 chance between three and four. That's different from this. And each of those will be different from there. But if you calculate the expected utility, dependent on each state, it's the same expected utility for each of these gambles. This is how you cook up the gambles. 
you find examples that have this property. Once they have that property, those models of ambiguity version have to rank them as indifferent. And here, it, you know, it, they won't let me distinguish between spreading to create ambiguity down here oops, or sp is spreading to create ambiguity up here. Um, so here's, here's what I've been trying to say. Um, the classic examples, every bet was involved winning $100 or zero. We had, um, we found ambiguity aversion there. Um, the classic models, the ones I've showed you, handle the Ellsberg paradoxes. They were designed to and they successfully do. Here's, now I'm beginning to make, this is the point of the talk. Once you have three or more outcome values, you get other phenomena. Like I was trying to show you, ambiguity at low versus high outcomes, things like that. These models ought to be able to ex address these things. And I looked at three aspects of ambiguity aversion that can reveal themselves only once you have a third outcome value. Um, and what's right and what's wrong? Remember, I've been telling you this whole time, well, I would prefer this bet over that, but you can do whatever. Ultimately, the question is, do people have those preferences? Okay. You know, maybe we'll find that people do have all these indifferences. Okay. If we do, that's nice for the models. And frankly, scientifically speaking, it's nice for us. Okay. I'd rather not have to weaken a model in light of a qualitatively new result. If I have to, I better. But if I don't have to, that's great. Who's going to answer that? Maya and her buddies. Okay. Well, Maya and others of my heroes. Um, okay, and basically this says we adapt as necessary, as much as necessary and only um, as, uh, only as much as necessary. Okay, you can tell them that the summer school's over if you want. It, it's almost over. Uh, it's almost objectively over. <laughs> Oh. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go try and find him. Okay. Well, I'll, if there's any questions, let me take them in the meantime. That's a good idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask so ambiguity, to some extent, seems like an underspecified model. And I don't know what psychologists would say about it, but if you put a person into an underspecified environment, they would look for various cues from the situation to help them make the decisions. So Fine. What, what is your. So could, does it make sense to write down? a model of decision making in underspecified situations. Well, here's, here's what these models are doing. They are, in, in your terms, they're taking very specific examples of what you would call underspecified situations. All these different kinds of Ellsberg urns. Very well defined unspecificity. Okay, now if, if you want to look at other options that are unspecified in some other way, what you, your job is to create them, you have to create this unspecificity specifically enough so that they live in the domain of these models. Okay, then it would be the model's job to say what are the preferences over th these things. But, but I'm happy to adopt your terminology. You know, I put it this way, betting on a coin is also unspecified. You haven't told me how much I'm going to get. Am ambiguity is a, is a scarier form of unspecificity. But, but I'm, I'm happy to accept those terms. Uh -huh. So that's how you show that how the traditional or, or old models cannot accommodate the examples you show. Do you think it's really the problem uh, of models or is the framework that you are using in the sense that you are uh, expressing everything as happening from well, um, that's, what, that's how the models, that's the properties the models have. They say, give me an urn, 
And the only thing that matters about that urn is how the expected utility depends on the state of nature. That's a property of the model. That's what I'm whining about. That's what these examples are designed to give problems to. So, uh, do you take issues with, for instance, Oscar Allman framework, or? You, um, you already know the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, uh, I do for reasons that are only partly related to this. Yeah. Um, it, it can accommodate those lateral lay preferences. Um, it's a little bit different. The one it can't accommodate is that slightly, is this one. No, it can't. That's right. This one has problems here. The rest of them have problems there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's wait for Eric. <laughs>